Hey, welcome back for more Bio 20. So today we're going to be talking about DNA and RNA. So our objectives and what we're going to do. So last time we talked about non-Mendelian inheritance and how we can violate a lot of Mendel's rules with things like being co-dominant or incompletely dominant or having multiple alleles. And we also looked at these two weird terms called epistasis and pleiotropy. Epistasis is genes interact and you get weird things going on. And pleiotropy is when um, one gene can give you multiple phenotypes. We also examine the concept of linkage, and that is genes are on the exact same chromosomes, and the result of that is independent assortment does not happen. And we can use recombination frequencies to say that, hey, look, they're different, or to determine that, oh, look, they actually are linked together or not. But more importantly, we looked at the concept of sex linkage, and that's when we have traits found on sex chromosomes, which are the X or Y chromosomes in mammals. And, and mainly when we say sex linkage, we mean the X chromosome with us mammals. And the result is you get some weird genetic patterns. So when we look at like what's ca causing all of this stuff that we see in Mendel, we knew about chromosomes, and we knew it was made out of this stuff that we called chromatin. And chromatin is a mixture of DNA and protein. And then when we started to realize, hey, the chromosomes have the genetic information on it, well, what's the source of that genetic information? And then through a series of experiments that we don't necessarily need to know about, we eventually found out that DNA was the genetic material. And one of the ways that we did that is through an experiment that led to what we call the transformation principle, which is rather fascinating. It looked at um, taking bacteria and two versions of it, what we would call a virulent and an avirulent versions, and how you could turn a avirulent version of bacteria into a virulent version. Virulence has to do with causing disease. Once we knew that, oh, it's DNA, then it became a race to figure out, well, who, uh, like, what, what's it sh what does it look like? And it turned out to be a three-way race between three different groups, two in England and one in America. And ultimately, two of the groups won. One of the groups backed out because just gave up. And ultimately, a very, very insanely short paper was published on April 25th, 19, 1953. This is incorrect. Um, was the day that it was published. It's a one-page paper, and it led to a Nobel Prize. There is controversy, however, with it, namely because this photo here, which is called P53, so picture number 53, um, was basically stolen from a woman by this man right here named James Watson, and it led to these two figuring out the structure of DNA. So they're the famous ones, Watson and Crick. So one on the left is James Watson. Guy on the right here is Francis Crick. And they got the Nobel Prize along with one of the two members of the other team. So Maurice Wilkins also won the Nobel Prize. The person who took this photo, her name was Rosalind Franklin. She died from ovarian cancer because she worked with x-rays, and you can't win the Nobel Prize if you're dead. And uh, her work was stolen from her. So this Nobel Prize comes with a lot of controversy. But ever since then, um, we've still been finding out lots of new things about DNA. We still haven't cracked all the secrets that it has. There's more secrets than we can imagine. So when we look at the structure of DNA and its relative, which is RNA, we know that they're made out of nucleotides. So nucleotides, if you recall, turn out to be a sugar, a base attached to that sugar, and then what we end up having are phosphates added, and that's what we call the nucleotide. Ultimately, the thing that we really care about, the sugar and the phosphate are kind of the same no matter what we do but it's the base that turns out to be important. And the bases make pairs. So it turns out that you can have a pair between an A and a T. Also of note, if you're dealing with RNA, we replace the T with a U. 
and it's connected by two hydrogen bonds. We remember those from once upon a time ago. Also, C can base pair with a G, and they form three hydrogen bonds. So, needless to say, a CG bond is stronger than an AT bond. When we look at DNA, it actually turns out to be have two strands. And when we look at this, it turns out, if you were to follow this strand here, it ends with them having ends. So we have one side that's red as 3 prime, and the other side is red as 5 prime. So the other strand is 5 prime to 3 prime. So in practical purposes, it's written, they're written like this. We call this being anti-parallel, which causes some trouble with DNA, but it also leads to some very interesting things about it. RNA, for the most part, is single-stranded, and because it's single-stranded, it actually has a lot more flexibility in terms of its shape, so it can actually form three-dimensional structures. And also, because of the way that it is built, it is far more reactive. So RNA can actually function, under certain circumstances, as enzymes. When I went to replicate DNA, it turns out there's some enzymes that play roles in this. The big players, the first one is called helicase, so I know that it's an enzyme because it ends with ace, and what does it do? It deals with the helix, and its job is to open up DNA into single strands. We also have an enzyme, so ace, and it says prime, so it's called primase, and what it does is it adds something called a primer. It turns out, like if you think of painting a room, you add a base layer underneath before you start adding the paint, and we call that a primer coat, or priming the walls. DNA can't replicate on its own. It needs a starting point. So it turns out RNA can just replicate out of nowhere. Fancy phrase is de novo. And the reason for this is that when we look at that, the fact that you know, there were those sides to DNA, five primes and the three primes. It turns out we can only add on to three prime ends. So DNA can only attach onto a three prime end. It does not have the ability, we do not have enzymes that allow it to attach to a five prime end. So the result of this is if I want to replicate DNA, I must give it a three prime end. Then the enzyme that actually does the dirty work, DNA polymerase, so ACE, it's an enzyme, and what does it do? It makes a polymer of DNA, and it's going to add new nucleotides to a three prime end. The way that I will end up writing these new nucleotides is I will call them DNTPs for deoxyribonucleic acid triphosphates. And that has to do with the energy needed to make this thing work. So when we want to replicate the DNA, it's relatively simple. What we'll do is we rip it open, and then we just add in the other side. Seems simple enough. When I look at a piece of DNA like this, I can actually tell you what the other side would be, because I can just say, oh, if this end here says three prime, down here I have, or five prime, then I have three prime, then I just fill it in. C base pairs with G, G with C, A, G, T, G, T, C, A, T, G, T, C, and then five prime end. Easy enough. In reality, I'd actually have to write it from right to left, but details. We know that this, when this happens, because it occurs during S phase of the cell cycle, so we actually already have known when all this stuff turns out to occur. So if I wanted to look at the actual details, when we go to replicate DNA, we actually open it up, and we create what we call a replication fork, and we call it that because it looks like this. We'll have a five prime and a three prime, and a three prime and a five prime. And what we're gonna see is one of these strands is gonna actually be okay to replicate, and the other side is going to kind of suck. The side where it's gonna be just fine to replicate is called the leading strand, and it turns out for reasons that if you look at it, you could figure it out, but we're not going to focus on it. This top side here turns out to be the leading strand, and then the side that kind of 
drags behind because it needs some additional help is called the lagging strand because it actually is broken up into pieces. This process goes until you're done. So in bacteria, they turn out to have circular DNA. So it turns out that when they open up their DNA, it's kind of simple, and this will go until eventually you have, say, I found the bad part of the iPad, but it breaks up into two pieces. For us eukaryotes, we actually have a problem with this, and it's called the telomer problem. So telomeres means the ends. So if I look at our DNA or our chromosomes, the ends are called telomeres. And it turns out when they replicate, they get shorter. And this, some people argue about what this means, and we don't care. Also during replication, this is when mutations can happen. So this is what it would look like overall. So here you see a replication fork. This top part here is what we would call a leading strand. This bottom here is the lagging strand. So in reality, um, this figure, which is from your book, is <laughs> actually has some issues. So this side over here is called the lagging strand. But if I were to look at this thing actually overall, on this top, this section up here actually becomes a lagging strand. And this bottom part down here becomes a leading strand. Because it turns out the rolls flip-flop depending on which direction you're looking. In terms of the telomeres, so it's an issue of where the primers go. And because we've run out of space, oops, we can't replicate. And the result is telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter every single time. So there's an enzyme that exists called telomerase, hence ACE. So it's an enzyme, and it's an enzyme that acts on the telomeres, hence telomer right there. And what it does is it actually allows for the full replication of the chromosome. We find this in germline cells. So cells that produce sperm and egg, they tend to have telomerase. There's another cell that, or type of cell that has telomerase, and it causes some trouble, and we call those cancer cells. Cancer cells typically reactivate their telomerase, and that's what helps make cancers quasi-immortal. So like I pointed out, there are mutations that occur during replication, and for the most part, we can correct most of them. So there's lots of mutations. Most of them turn out to be corrected. We don't care about the mechanisms, although there are three of them that are listed here. One of them is called DNA proofreading, one of them is called mismatch repair, and the other one is called nucleotide excision. We keep about three mutations every single round of, mu of replication. Not mutation, but this is replication. So... That doesn't mean that we only make three. There's only three that we don't catch. There's a lot more that are made. We just don't catch three of them. And for the sake of saying it, we have three billion base pairs. So that's not bad. One in a billion that shows up. The actual replication mechanism itself produces errors like one every 10,000. So we make a lot, and we correct most of them. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy, but what do you do with your DNA? Well, they contain genes. And it turns out DNA is a storage vessel for genes, and it's a relatively stable storage vessel. So when we look at our genes, they turn out to have some parts. So they're going to have a start-stop location. They're going to have a place for an enzyme to bind called RNA polymerase. So I write P-O-L for polymerase because it's easier than writing polymerase. And then we need to have a start or stop for transcription. And if I find these regions in a piece of DNA, congratulations, you found a gene. It is worth noting that we usually talk about what we call the central dogma. And the central dogma is DNA is used to make RNA, which is used to make protein. 
and this is how we thought for a very long time. Turns out it's not actually correct, because we are now discovering that there are all sorts of genes that do not make proteins. So they make proteins. So we used to look at our DNA and say, wow, a lot of this is just junk. And it turns out, no, it just does something else. This here is an example of what eukaryotic genes look like, where we'll have some type of control regulation. We'll have a transcription start. We have stuff. We have a transcription stop. And then we'll talk about this next week, but we do stuff to um, the RNA. So the process of transcription is relatively simple. We're going to open up DNA at a promoter region, which is where RNA polymerase will bind. So RNA polymerase is going to make a polymer of RNA. Seems simple enough. This formation of this copy of DNA into RNA is called transcription. So it's kind of like if you were to go to a courtroom and there's, everyone talks and there's going to be a person whose job it is to type down everything that's said. So you can't trust a recording because sometimes you mumble. So you sit there and you type, 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 type. And what they're creating is a transcript. It's turning spoken English into written English. But it's still English. What we're doing here in this particular case is we're making a different version of a nucleic acid. DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids and we're just making a different version. You should be able to predict RNAs because they're pretty simple. So if this turns out to be my piece of DNA, I can actually predict the RNA, which is the other side. So it actually turns out to be just like before where we actually have the opposite strand. So if it goes three prime to five prime, the piece of RNA would be five prime to three prime. Whenever you have a T, it will base pair with an A. A, instead of base pairing with a T, base pairs with a U. And then we just fill in the rest. So G, G, C, A, G, U, G, C, A, U, G, C, A, G, U. Three prime. Turns out that the RNA that is produced, there's actually several types. So we can make one type that's called mRNA, and it's used to make proteins. We could use a different type of RNA called rRNA, and it makes ribosomes. We talked about those a long time ago. We could have tRNA, and these are helped, or they help out with making proteins. We also have these weirdos down here. LNCRNA, long non-coding RNA, miRNA, microRNAs, siRNAs, which are small interfering RNAs. These are actually all regulatory, meaning they help turn things on and off. This is what the process of transcription looks like. So we have RNA polymerase, and what you'll notice is there'll be one strand that is used and the other strand is ignored. The phraseology I like to use is this is called the sense, or excuse me, this top one here is called the sense strand because sense means it looks like, you know, the gene or it looks like the mRNA. And if I look at this, like AUG, ATG, it's pretty similar. All I did was swap out the T's for the U's, and it says CCG, CCG. So these two look similar. But this bottom strand is used to replicate, and that's why it's a template because you use a template to make something. So when we do replication, we use both strands of DNA, but transcription is not that way. We only use one of the two strands. And this actually makes for some fun little puzzles that happen for reasons we don't care about, but you could have seen it Genes are, have directionality to them. But here's the catch with genes. I can have a gene here on one strand of DNA, and then the next gene can be on the bottom. And then the next gene could also be on the bottom. And then the next one could be on the top. By us having two strands of DNA, we can have two different 
locations of where these genes are found. And it turns out that they run from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So we can actually see that some on the top strand of DNA and some are on the bottom strand of DNA. With mRNA, if that's the RNA that we make through transcription, it turns out we modify it. So we're going to remove some parts that are called introns. Introns are in the way. And we're going to keep things that are called exons, which are expressed. And obviously we're going to add some modifications too. Not, well, not obviously, but we modify it. We add a cap and a tail. And what these say to the cell is, don't destroy me. This is what that kind of looks like. So when we take our original piece of RNA, we're going to have these things called exons that are in there, and then we have these introns. And through a fancy um, mechanism, we can splice them out. So splicing is when you cut and then join things together. If you've ever edited movies or edited videos, that's what you're doing. You're splicing things. We add a cap. The cap actually turns out not to be that big. And we add a tail. The tail is bigger than that. But also most curiously is that we have these regions on the, the two sides, the five prime end and on the three prime end, that do not undergo the next step. They are not translated. They do other things. This process here is for mRNA. So when we talk about exons and introns, we are only talking about mRNA. We're not talking about other things. This so week in lab, we're going to practice uh, DNA, RNA, protein. So on Tuesday of next week, we're going to talk about how do we make proteins, which is protein synthesis or translation. And then we're going to figure out how do we control all this stuff.